Uh, since 9-11, the scope of our responsibility has changed. It was thrown in front of our faces quite violently on that day. We, as law enforcement entity, whether it be federal, state, municipal, county, doesn't matter. We need to be up to the task, and that task is changed slightly. That task requires new parameters, forward thinking, and thinking outside the box. The more that we can do that and help try to predict what we feel may happen on a tactical side uh, from these people that would do us harm, we will be that much better prepared. Welcome to this special program on SWAT operations. Part of being prepared for the future is knowing the past. Let's look at the origins of tactical teams. The first actual uh, employment of a, uh, a SWAT type of unit uh, occurred in the 1920s in Shanghai, China, which uh, uh, during those years was one of the most violent cities that the world has ever seen. A uh, captain uh, in the Shanghai Municipal Police Department by the name of William Fairburn hand-selected and identified a group of his officers to um, handle special problems that came up. And in that regard, they used such things as automatic weapons, uh, body armor, chemical agents, carbines, and uh, long rifles. Um, so uh, that kind of weaponry um, is very close to what we're still using uh, pretty much today in the, in the SWAT environment. Around the mid-70s, average police officer, deputy sheriff, uh, carried a, probably a revolver, maybe a semi-automatic pistol, may have had a shotgun in the car, maybe not, and probably not much more than that. Police just weren't equipped to deal with that type of high-risk uh, encounter in America. You know, America was still pretty even keeled. But the events from the 60s, the anti-war protests, the radical movement, the uh, homegrown domestic terrorists, those events raised the bar and the police were uh, in a position to, re the police needed to respond and they, need, they were a little bit slow at it, but once they got going, that's how SWAT teams developed. As far as um, the history of SWAT in California is concerned, uh, in the mid-60s, uh, 1960s, the Delano Police Department created a special unit uh, for the purpose of dealing with the violence um, that was attendant with the uh, United Farm Worker um, labor strikes. Also attendant at, at that time in the country, we were seeing things happening like attacks uh, on police stations, uh, attacks on the street on individual police officers. We had the uh, Texas Tower incident uh, in, in Texas. Um, we had the Black Panther shootout. Uh, in the late 60s in Los Angeles, and uh, society uh, as a whole was suffering at the hands of a lot of violent people. So based on that, uh, police departments uh, around the country began to look at ways of handling some of these special problems. Uh, and one of those ways was to create a, a special unit. One of the first departments to create such a unit was the Los Angeles Police Department. They called their team SWAT, uh, which stands for Special Weapons and Tactics, although there are many other teams throughout the country that aren't necessarily recognized as SWAT. Uh, they may be called something else, SEB, SET, uh, CERT, any, any number of acronyms, but in essence they all perform the same function. It's somewhere about the mid-70s, uh, after law enforcement recognized the need for specialized teams, a number of uh, Vietnam veterans and um, other military veterans uh, were employed in law enforcement at the time. These folks were the catalyst or the, uh, the first SWAT team or specialty type team members. They brought with them some military training, some military experiences, and that background helped formulate these specialized teams who were designed to focus on these high risk, high threat events. And from the beginning to where we're at today, SWAT has always become a life-saving entity that the community can turn to in the time of need where other people would run away from gunfire. SWAT are the individuals that run towards the gunfire. Negotiations started uh, as a result of work done by the New York City Police Department. It was motivated by a couple of major tragic, very tragic incidents. Uh, the Attica Prison uprising in upstate New York, uh, September 1971. The second, of course, again, another uh, internationally famous or infamous event, and that's the uh, Munich uh, hostage-taking incident in the, at the Olympics in 1972. Once New York City PD got their hostage negotiations unit up and running, uh, it began to spread 
across the country. San Francisco was one of the early teams to early agencies to adopt and develop a hostage negotiation team that we now call crisis negotiations. Statistics point to the success of SWAT and CNT units in California and across the nation. Since the creation of the LAPD SWAT unit, in over 170 hostage incidents, only one hostage has died as a result of police action. In an ongoing FBI study of hostage barricade incidents, almost 90% are successfully resolved by negotiation and or tactical intervention, and hostages survive over 90% of the time. Despite these successes, SWAT and CNT units must continuously evolve their tactics to conform to changes in the law, technological advances, and societal expectations in order to be ready for future incidents. Well, if you look at the history of uh, the evolution of tactical teams from the 60s and 70s, locally, nationally, internationally, there's a, uh, I think, a kind of a common thread where we have been caught off guard at times. And that's one of the key points about tactical teams, being prepared with the proper training so when those unusual incidents come at us, we're uh, better ready to take them on and successfully end them. One of the incidents that uh, kind of shaped our tactics and uh, shaped how we respond to incidents was the uh, 1999 incident at Columbine High School in Littleton, Colorado. Traditional SWAT response is get there, surround, you know, set up a perimeter. Well, in that particular case, people were dying, so they had to reanalyze everything and went to more of an active shooter situation where small teams will be formed to actively go after the uh, perpetrator. Over the last several years, uh, there have been a couple of incidents that have taken place, major hostage-taking hostage events uh, occurring in Russia, again, uh, internationally known. Moscow, uh, the theater incident, uh, Beslan in North Ossetia, uh, school takeover incident, both ended very, very tragically. That pretty clearly involved terrorist operators, major hostage taking incidents, uh, and given the fact that they were both post uh, September 11, 2001, uh, have given cause for us to be a little bit more concerned and be ready for those types of incidents again coming to, coming to America. SWAT teams and departments need to start thinking uh, outside the box somewhat if they haven't already done so. Experts in the field tell us that it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when we start seeing terrorist activity in this country again. Uh, Islamist terrorists have proven in the past uh, that they are prone to taking over schools. Schools are soft targets. Our schools in this country are especially soft targets. Most of them have no security whatsoever. So they're easy prey f for terrorists. Uh, it gets terrorists a lot of publicity. It's, it's a large body count if their operation is successful, and that's what they're looking for. So that type of an attack could be absolutely devastating to this country unless we start preparing uh, for the means and, and the methods to deal with those kinds of situations. Before going further, Let's define what exactly a SWAT team is. It is any designated group of law enforcement officers who are selected, trained, and equipped to work as a coordinated team to safely resolve critical incidents that are so hazardous, complex, or unusual that they may exceed the capabilities of first responders or investigative units. SWAT teams save lives, lives of hostages, lives of victims, lives of officers, and even lives of suspects. We do this through time, teamwork, tactics, specialized equipment, and negotiations. SWAT is just one component of a coordinated tactical response. Sometimes SWAT teams are in support of negotiations, and other times negotiations are in support of a tactical resolution. Either way, one thing we do know from history is that a coordinated effort between tactical team members and negotiations substantially increases the likelihood of a successful resolution. A crisis negotiations team is a designated group of personnel specifically selected, trained, and equipped to assist in the resolution of critical incidents by means of communication and negotiation with criminal suspects and other persons, often in conjunction with the SWAT tactical unit. Throughout history, I think we unfortunately have seen these two as separate teams, a crisis negotiations element and a SWAT team, and basically a linear type of process where first we talk to these folks and if it doesn't work then we, we engage in assault or become tactical. I think most of agencies have learned and we've realized throughout history that this is a collaborative effort that needs to be coordinated together throughout the entire incident 
not a linear process at all. They have to work together, they have to communicate with each other, they have to train together, it's critical. If they don't, if they're not working in conjunction and they're working on separate radio channels, they have separate agendas, maybe they don't get along personality-wise, uh, you're going to have potential is there for problems. You know, crisis negotiating is uh, definitely an art. Um, it's not a science that uh, we respond with the SWAT team. So we are the, uh, the voice of the SWAT team. Our job is to try to negotiate safe surrender of not only the suspects, but to get the victims out, uh, to get you know, the poor people out that can't speak for themselves. You know, I look at my job as if I can get everybody out of the house, that prevents the SWAT team from going in. And one of my SWAT brothers or sisters might be killed by doing that. So you know, that's our job is just you know, be the voice of reason and get everybody to calm down, see things clearly, and come on out to prevent you know, a bad outcome. The use of crisis negotiations in, in helping to resolve uh, these critical incidents um, can really be beneficial in determining one of the most important things, and that is the motivation of the subject or the suspect. Um, quite often a tactical team who is on the perimeter and covering the outside doesn't know what's going on, what the dynamic is, what's driving the incident of the individual inside. And that's why it's imperative for a negotiations team to get that information, to develop rapport with the person to find out what actually uh, is driving the incident. A subject who, who takes sausages spontaneously, as in the example of a, a bank robbery, and, and he gets caught and takes tellers, is very different from as an example, a male who kidnaps his ex-wife at her place of business, takes her home and barricades, uh, that individual doesn't want money or a car or is even concerned about jail. He wants her, and he doesn't want anyone else to have her. In addition to determining the motivation, uh, negotiators can also help possibly delay the subject's um, destructive actions by at least engaging them or, or distracting them with, with dialogue. Um, it will stop them from possibly participating in the, the dangerous actions they were planning. In 2005, Post published the SWAT Operational Guidelines and Standardized Training Recommendations. The document was developed with the combined efforts of over 130 subject matter experts, including SWAT team members and supervisors, managers and department executives. I was uh, involved in a small degree in the uh, development of the guidelines, which are now kind of a uh, very helpful document to agencies, no matter what size they are, that have tactical teams. That kind of grew out of a tragedy that shouldn't have probably happened, but it did. We've got to learn uh, how to avoid those in the future. And I think the guidelines are an excellent way of helping us uh, collectively to make sure those kinds of incidents don't take place again. I think everybody had the expectation that we were going to come out with policies and procedures that could be immediately adapted by every police department and used immediately. That wasn't the case. What we actually came up with were recommended uh, guidelines, minimum guidelines. It's still incumbent upon each agency to take a look at those minimum guidelines, determine what their mission in life is. If it's only going to serve high-risk uh, narcotic warrants, then you better train for that. But if you're also going to do uh, counter sniping, shooting from airborne uh, vehicles, if you're going to engage in dignitary protection, uh, things of that nature, well then of course your training has to increase, your policy procedures need to develop more uh, aligned with those types of operations. So we just provide the minimum. It's now incumbent upon each department to take those and expand upon them. It should be noted that nothing in the post-SWAT guidelines is intended to preclude agencies from utilizing specially trained units in narcotics investigations, felony apprehensions, and other tasks. One of the things we know about critical incidents is they can occur in any city or any town at any time. You could be faced with an active shooter situation, a, host a hostage rescue incident, or even a terrorist event on your next shift. It doesn't matter if you work in a large metropolitan department where you have thousands of officers at your disposal, or you work in a rural county sheriff's office where your backup's more than 30 minutes away. History has proven these events happen everywhere. And since the next big incident could be difficult to predict or forecast, every agency needs to take an all-hazards approach to training and preparing to respond to these incidents. In this special segment for SWAT and CNT personnel, we'll cover the following topics. SWAT, CNT, and Incident Command working together. Using canines. Use of force policy. Post-incident issues. Ongoing training. Common errors. And a wrap-up segment. This segment is not intended as comprehensive SWAT and CNT training, 
but merely to provide additional information and point out issues sometimes overlooked by SWAT and CNT personnel.